tous ceux qui ont collaboré euh, au travail du général de Gaulle en gardent un souvenir extraordinaire. Il était très très proche de ses enfants. Pas du tout le genre câlin, mais le genre euh, plein d'affection. Yvonne de Gaulle, elle a vraiment préservé l'intimité du général de Gaulle, elle a vraiment protégé son mari jusqu'au bout. Hello and welcome to France in Focus. Today, we are 44 meters up in the air, standing on a monument to French resistance. This is the Cross of Lorraine. And we're here because this week we're celebrating probably France's most famous resistance leader, Charles de Gaulle. Now, he died 50 years ago, but he spent much of his life here in the village of colombe le deux églises And he and his wife also raised their children here. A 30-year-old Captain de Gaulle in 1920, the same year he met a certain Yvonne Van Roo when she was 20 years old. Later on, she saw him again. They danced the foxtrot. And when she went home, she said, it's him or no one. So she was a very determined young woman. A young woman who was to become a lifelong source of support for Charles de Gaulle. The couple married in 1921 and soon became the happy parents of Philippe and Elizabeth. The arrival of their third child, Anne, in 1928, troubled those calm waters. Born with Down syndrome, the baby was showered with love and she shared a special bond with her father. He was always singing songs to her. He rocked her to sleep. He was very worried if she ever fell over. Yet in 1948, at just 20 years old, Anne was carried off by a severe bout of pneumonia. They were devastated. The general was simply devastated. Yvonne tried to be strong for him, and he looked at his wife. With this very poetic turn of phrase, he said, now she is just like the others. Charles and Yvonne turned to their grandchildren for consolation, a source of warmth and affection, and their mutual love remains a fond memory today. There was an enormous amount of respect. They listened to each other, they were very sweet. You could sense all that, of course, at a time when public displays of affections weren't the done thing. But my grandfather had an enormous amount of respect for his wife, immense. An unwavering bond that the de Gaulle's shared throughout their marriage, during the presidency and beyond. A sense of complicity that shored up a couple who left their mark on the history of France. De Gaulle bought this place known as La Boisserie in 1934, and it became his much-loved home. Aurore Jacquinot is the curator here. So Charles de Gaulle, he loved this place, La Boisserie. What does it tell us about him? General de Gaulle said this house restored his serenity. He loved the calm and tranquility of the surroundings. Charles and Yvonne had simple tastes. So it's far from a manor or a chateau. It's a very simple house, almost austere. It really suited them both very well. So we are in Charles de Gaulle's study. Tell us what happened in this room. Here, the general wrote all of his memoirs, his war memoirs and the memoirs of hope, as well as some of his speeches. There are lots of interesting things in this room. You might have noticed something missing. There's no telephone. General de Gaulle hated the telephone. He didn't want to keep being interrupted all the time, so the telephone was hidden away in a cupboard under the stairs. That way the general could properly concentrate. He also had made-to-measure furniture. If you look carefully, you'll see the desk and chair are higher than normal. 
Artisans from Paris crafted all of this furniture specifically for him and gave it to him after the war in 1947. And we have here the most sort of magnificent gardens. Tell me, did Charles de Gaulle used to walk a lot in these gardens? Tout à fait. Le général yes, the general loved walking in his park, and he invited all of his visitors to do the same. Visitors like German Chancellor Konrad Adenauer, who took a walk around the grounds with de Gaulle in September 1958. He spent more time discussing things in the garden than he did inside because he thought it helped the conversation flow better. So this is the library and Charles de Gaulle was a prolific reader so I imagine he spent a lot of time in here but he also died in this room, didn't he? Yes, Charles de Gaulle died at this bridge table. He played cards every evening before tuning into the television. On the 9th of November 1970, he became sick and died very soon after, at about 7.30 p.m. at this very table. It was when he was about to turn 80 years old. And I've heard that um, before he died, he told his wife, Yvonne, to burn some of his personal effects. Is that true? Oui, tout à fait. Alors ça, c'est vrai que c'est assez étonnant. Euh, Charles et Yvonne de Gaulle... Yes, it's rather remarkable. We suspect that Charles and Yvonne de Gaulle had decided beforehand to burn and destroy everything personal to the two of them. So the night of his funeral, Yvonne de Gaulle took his clothes, their bed, even the tableware, everything personal to them, and burnt it all in front of the house. The neighbors saw a huge fire go up and had no idea what was going on. So Yvonne de Gaulle preserved her husband's privacy and protected him right until the end. Well, Aurore Jacquino, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to show us around uh, this house today. Merci à vous. was a towering figure, six foot and five inches tall. He also had a towering personality. He could be charismatic, but also arrogant and difficult. In this report, we'll look at how his persona influenced his professional life. Everyone who worked with General de Gaulle has extraordinary memories of him. De Gaulle was profoundly courteous and extremely respectful of those working for him. He could be cutting, but he was never disrespectful. Ministers, assistants, political opponents, hundreds came into the orbit of Charles de Gaulle. On the 18th of June 1940, the Germans had taken Paris. De Gaulle was in London, ready to make his famous appeal for French resistance. His secretary at the time, Elisabeth de Miribel, transcribed the speech, which was broadcast to France by the BBC. He was like a rock in a storm. He was very tall, in his uniform with those smart trousers. He was extremely calm. As well as he managed to keep his nerve when the hour was darkest, de Gaulle was also known for his fits of rage. His personal assistants were the ones always with the general, as his first point of contact. They were tasked with everyday jobs like passing on messages. He would yell at assistants and other staff. They would pass on the message to the relevant person in a different form, because sometimes it was very harsh, rude even. He often used the word moron. <laughs> It's well documented just how exacting he was, with himself as much as with others. And if life for his cabinet wasn't easy, de Gaulle was a huge headache for diplomats and political opponents, who accused him of being far too stubborn. Even his ally Winston Churchill complained of his insufferable rudeness in private telegrams. The British viewed him in a very negative light. They expected more gratitude from him. Perhaps in the end, though, not fawning over the British was part of his success. 
Once the war was over, the quarrels between Churchill and de Gaulle eventually became water under the bridge and were replaced with mutual respect. With his wishes, de Gaulle was buried here in Colombe le des Eglises alongside his wife and his daughter Anne. And half a century after his death, it is clear that de Gaulle still wields enormous influence in France. He's not a figure without criticism, but for many people, he remains today an icon of the modern French state. Well, we will leave it here for this episode. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you at the same time next week. You have enjoyed your program with Air France Protect, promising you a pleasant trip with total peace of mind. Appointed by the dictator Franco as next in line to the Spanish throne, Juan Carlos I was long respected as the king of Spain's democratic transition. But today, he may turn out to be the cause of the monarchy's downfall. Money laundering, tax evasion, suspicious gifts, the scandals never seem to stop. He relinquished the throne and went into exile in the United Arab Emirates. Discredited and vulnerable, the monarchy is now supported only by a minority. For whatever reason, though, it doesn't seem unduly worried. Which poses the question, is it possible to envisage a third republic in Spain? Revisited, presented by Stuart Norville, on France 24 and France24.com.